I told you you were blessed to have that worship team. Do you get it? Yeah. Last night during worship practice, and, and let me tell you that every one of us has to learn. Every one of us is continually growing. But they didn't just practice songs. Okay? This isn't, it wasn't about having a song service. Songs are great. You go to a concert, you turn on the radio. This was about worship. And let me tell you something about worshipers and, and the, the musicians and the minstrels. They went out in front of the army. Okay? The trumpeters went out in front of the army. Praise and worship drives the enemy back. If you believe you're blessed, pray for them. Because they are the front line of the battle. They are the ones that help you come into a place of worship and praise that then in turn pushes the enemy away from you and gives you space. We don't create distance from the enemy by backing up because we're giving up ground God has already given us. We create distance by moving forward. We start off with praise and with worship, with adoration of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You are blessed that they want to worship and not just play music. Join them. We're going to do a couple of working definitions, but I know I put on your thing to leave your phones in your car, but I had to do this because I got something today that I, that I want to share with you. I don't know if any of you use version in your Bible for your app, you know, Bible app. It's on the iPads and on the phones and, and everywhere else. Did anybody get the verse of the day? All right. Check out the verse of today. Don't tell me God's timing isn't just absolutely perfect. <laughs> Psalm 100, verse 4 and 5. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. That's what you guys did this morning. You entered into his court with praise. You know how you entered into his courts? Wow, this ties into that vision that we had last night. As the worship team was playing, God gave me this vision of them on this, this street, this street. It was almost like a walkway, but it was really wide. And there was this glimmering city just right in front of them. And as they played, the gates opened up and people just rushed out to join them. You enter the courts when the gates are open. Praise opens the gates. Praise and worship breaks down strongholds that the enemy has in your life. It overcomes distractions. But you have to get there. They can worship, but they can't make you worship. Your pastor can, can give you great food from the Word of God. And let me tell you something, not just because he's my brother, okay? But you guys are so blessed to have a pastor who wants to be true to the word. Amen. Who doesn't care if you're offended by it. Okay? So my heart was blessed last week when somebody thanked him. Right? Because there are teachers out there all over and they're getting stronger and they're getting bigger and their numbers are growing. That are tickling the ears of those who just want to tickle. They're teaching them things that are false. Like God only wants you to be happy. God's most joyful when you're happy. Well, good. If that's the case, man, I couldn't, you know what? It's hard. I don't even have a car that I want right now, so I can't even say. It used to be when, when I was younger, I could spit out on a Mercedes 450 SL, silver, fully loaded, convertible, right? That would make me happy. So if I'm happy then with that Mercedes, then God must be joyful. <laughs> Ain't happening. But you know how many people go to that church every week? Tens of thousands. Yeah. Okay? Tens of thousands. In Houston, um, I used to call it Nineveh. <laughs> because when, when God called me from Colorado to go there, I was not a happy camper. Okay, I used to call it Nineveh. And then I went from Nineveh to suburb of hell. 
<laughs> um, but that's just where God has me right now. As soon as he says go, I'm out of there. As long as, no, I have to be careful. Because <laughs> I don't want to say as long as it's someplace good, right? Because <laughs> I'm going to end up in the desert somewhere. <laughs> um, um, it's twice that I've said I'll never live in a certain place and God moved me there. So I started saying I'll never live in Hawaii. <laughs> God just smiled, right? Yeah, right, nice try, kid. Okay. Um, the, the false teachers are growing. In Houston, recently, um, he, he passed away, supposedly, right? That's what his disciples say. He didn't really die. He died at Methodist Hospital in Sugarland, Texas in 2013. Jose de Jesus Miranda claimed to be Jesus Christ. The second coming. He was a, a heroin addict, spent all kinds of time in prison, got saved in prison. I did some prison ministry. There are some genuine, incredible conversions of things God did, he does. And then there's guys who have their Bible marked up and know their Bible better than me that walk out the gate when they get free and they toss it in the trash can. Okay? It happens. But he said that he was praying one day and Jesus Christ himself showed up right in front of him. And he entered into his body and consumed him, and he became Christ. He has millions of followers all over the world. An interview was done, and, and one of the ladies that they interviewed said, Some people say he's of the devil. But if he's of the devil, then I'm going to go to hell with him because he makes me happy. Church, this is what we're getting. That's what people are hearing. That's what people are believing. Your pastor doesn't care if you're offended by something that's in the Word. I know he doesn't. I know he doesn't. You are blessed. Pray for him. Unceasingly. If you think somebody that's willing to stand up for the Word of God with all they have is not under attack, Constantly, you're mistaken. We're going to do a couple of things. I want to give you a couple of quick definitions of, of, of things. Some of our, uh, our worship this morning, man, that was incredible. Um, it talks about holy. And holy, you know, is a church word. Um, unless you're saying holy cow. In which case, you're probably Hindu. Um, okay. <laughs> holy, right, it is a church word. It's a word to describe God, but we use it so much we call him a holy God, but do we really know what that means? You know, when, when God first came on the scene to humanity, right, and he, and he met Abraham, Abram at the time, he said, man, I want you to move out of there. I relate to that. I want you to go to a land that you don't know people that you don't know. I want you to go there. So he kind of went halfway and waited until his dad died and then packed up and went again. Then we move forward and we see that, that he tells them that you know his descendants are going to inherit the land. Great. But first they're going to spend 400 years in captivity. How old is this country? We'd be just over halfway. Okay, That's a long time. And then we see God enter the scene. We see in a bush that seemed to be on fire, but wasn't. Moses set his heart to go see what it was. And God spoke to him there. And then God led the children of Israel out. And, and what God told him is, God told Moses, said, this will be a sign to you that this is really me, that I'm really the Almighty God. You will lead the children out of Israel and they will come to this mountain and what? Worship me. <clears throat> now, holy. A characteristic unique to God's nature, which becomes the goal for human character. The idea of holy is important for an understanding of God, of worship, and of the people of God in the Bible. It has four distinct meanings. First, to be set apart. This applies to places where God is present, like the temple, the tabernacle, the mountain that they came to. And the things and persons related to those holy places 
or to God himself, like the tools used in the temple in the sacrificial system. Next, it means to be perfect, transcendent, or spiritually pure, evoking adoration and reverence. This applies primarily to God, but secondarily to saints or godly people. Next, it means something or someone who evokes veneration or awe, being frightening beyond belief. This is clearly the application to God and is the primary meaning of holy. Listen, who evokes veneration or awe, being frighteningly beyond belief or comprehension. <clears throat> it is continued with the last definition, filled with superhuman and potential fatal power. This speaks of God, but also of places or things or persons which have been set apart by God's presence. A saint is a holy person. To be sanctified is to be made holy. Okay? And then worship, the, the working definition we're going to use is human response to the perceived presence of the divine. A presence which transcends normal human activity and is holy. When the children of Israel came to the mountain in Exodus, we read where God called Moses to the mountain. Moses had to work to get there. It wasn't easy. It was a journey. He had to climb the mountain. And God said, tomorrow, I'm going to come down on the mountain. I want you to make sure you set perimeters. Okay? Set perimeters. The people or the animals are not to touch the mountain or they shall be put to death. The mountain was a holy place. The limits were set so to keep unauthorized people out. Okay? I worked for 11 years in the neighborhood <laughs> church group activity in a top secret clearance building. And uh, in that building, I could go anywhere. There were people who worked in other parts of the building that come in, could not come into my spaces. There was a door marked with code words and, a, yeah, a combination code to the door. It was to keep unauthorized people out. This is what God did. He set limits. I'm holy. Do not let the people or even the animals touch the mountain or they shall be put to death. In fact, he says, don't even touch them yourselves. You shall stone them or shoot them. And he said, the priests, the priests could go up a little ways. Call the priests to a certain place. They were called out for a specific reason, for a specific person or place and purpose. And then he said, I want you to take Aaron and come with me. Why? Aaron was going to be consecrated as the high priest. So bring Aaron and come with me. And it says that God descended upon the mountain with a dark cloud and the mountain rumbled. And the people were in awe. And the people were afraid. That's holy. Now... If we were the, that people, we couldn't go to the mountain. We couldn't get on the We could stand back. Wow, yep. Moses got to go, and he got to go hang out with God. We don't get to go. The priests, well, they got to go up partway on the mountain. We don't get to go. 1,200 years. This is the mindset of the Jewish people. A holy God that is separate. A holy God that is unapproachable. Now we have throughout the Old Testament the prophets. Isaiah stood in, stood in the throne room of God and what was the first words out of his mouth? Oh crap, I'm in trouble. Right? I live with these yokels and you're screwed up. Right? We see God met the different needs and he spoke through the prophets. But about 1,200 years after the law was given, 1,400 years, a prophecy was fulfilled. A prophecy was fulfilled that said a virgin would give birth to a son. And you shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. The holy God, the separate God, the one that we couldn't touch, the one that we couldn't come to, has now clothed himself in flesh and blood and dwelt among us. You wonder why the Jews couldn't get it? 
We had 1,200 years of, of holy and separated. We can't get there. We've got to go through the priest. And the high priest could only go into the temple one time a year. And he better be have got himself taken care of or he's dropping dead. They tied a string, a rope to his foot. And they had bells on his rope. Because when the bells stopped ringing, they jerked him out. That's their mindset. And now we have the prophecy of Isaiah fulfilled in Christ. He came down. And when he began his ministry, what were the, the words that he gave? Come, follow me. Come, follow me. Oh, dude, wait a minute. If you're God, they can get it. Who's Jesus? Oh, he's a prophet from Nazareth. He was God. He was now relatable. He wanted relationship. Now, it's the same God. The same exact God. In fact, if you look at Psalms 46.10, okay? I didn't put it in my notes because God, I wanted to use it, but it's right here. Psalm 46.10. This is the same God. This is the God of the original testament, Right? This is the, the holy God that's separated, that lives in a tabernacle. Put that picture up, please. The tabernacle where the Shekinah glory comes down. Notice that the people around the edges outside of their tents, they're just spectators. That's all they were allowed to do was watch. They couldn't enter in to the mighty presence of God. But the psalmist, the worshiper, right? The one who could worship, who knew what it was to enter into the presence of God, he writes, but God says. This is prophetic. This is a word from God. This is God speaking. David just writing furiously. God says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Even in the Old Testament, there was a way to know God. To know, what is it? I love the way he says, to know that I am God. When Jesus used the words I am in response to a question, everybody fell backwards at the power. God says, he tells David, tell the people, be still and know that I am God. Our goal is to enter. See, it's because Jesus took care of it all. Not only did he come and teach us how to, to be in relationship with God himself. He brought in arms open wide, said, come to me. Suffer not the little children to come to me. Sitting on their lap, hanging out with people, just doing life with them. That's what he did. <clears throat> Clothed himself in flesh went to the cross to pay the ultimate price to redeem us, to purchase us, so that we too could come into fellowship with the almighty, living, powerful, and holy God. That's what he did. He restored us to a place that we could confidently go to the throne room of God, as the word tells us. Go confidently. I don't know what you would can. Even knowing that in my head, I can't imagine my knees not knocking like crazy and being like Isaiah, woe unto me. But he did it. And when he died, that thick veil of a curtain was ripped in two. It was ripped apart. It didn't just fall off the hook. You know, the, the, the screw that was holding it in just didn't give out and it just fell down. That thing rent in two and the Shekinah glory of God was exposed for all to see. For all to enter in and come into. You and me, we have the privilege because of what Christ did to enter into his presence. To go to the holy place. To spend time with him. But what does he say? He says you've got to be still. I said last week, Africa is the, the devil's playground. And it is. Voodoo, witch doctors, evil. I mean, just prevalent. You can see it in their eyes. If Satan did that here immediately, dropped it, 
We'd recognize it, wouldn't we? Ah, that's of the devil. Now, we don't, we don't serve, an, I mean, we serve an incredible God, but our enemy is not stupid. Okay? He's the ruler of this world. Hallelujah, we are not, what? Of this world. We're in it. We have to deal with it. But there's power in the name of Jesus, church. Amen. There is power in the name of Jesus. Just like your worshipers are going forth and they're going forward and they're moving you in the forward direction, you have to follow. You can't give up ground. The enemy will continue to keep you busy. He will continue to keep you busy. You get a time and you think, oh, wow, all right, I, I, can, I can have some quiet time with the Lord. The phone will ring. Something is going to come up. Satan does not want you to enter into that place. Why? Because when you do, you hear from God. You know beyond a shadow of doubt what God wants you to do, what He's called you to do. When you enter into that place, you are blessed beyond belief. You receive peace and joy unspeakable and full of glory. It drives away fear. It drives away hate. It drives away frustration and anger. You can't be those things when you're there. Why? Because it's the Holy Spirit that takes us there in spirit. In spirit. In spirit. But guys, we're too impatient. We're too impatient. The Lord says to you this morning, Stop! Stop! Not just slow down. Not just change direction. Just stop. And wait. Over and over and over in the scripture, especially in the Psalms, we see that we have to wait on the Lord. That we have to wait on the Lord. Over and over and over. Write this down so you can read it later. Read Psalm 27. Read Psalm 27. You gotta wait. And when you wait, God will meet you. God will meet you. When I first started this, when the Lord really laid on my heart and just really showed me the be still part, man, I thought, well, okay, I'm gonna be still. It's a long time, I don't get anything. It's been two minutes, right? What about, God, what about three minutes and 37 seconds? Will that be good enough? Can I just be still that long? I think God laughs at me a lot. Not mean. He just kind of shakes his head and says, yeah, nice try, kid. Right? Be still and know. So that means God is going to reveal himself, isn't he? God is going to reveal himself. The veil has been lifted. 2 Corinthians 3, 12 through 18 says this, Therefore, I'm only going to read through 17 probably. Therefore, having such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech. And we are not like Moses, who used to put a veil over his face so that the sons of Israel would not look intently at the end of what was fading away. But their minds were hardened. For until this very day, at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted, because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. There's no more veil. <laughs> now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The veil is taken away. The veil is taken away. Wait. Wait on the Lord. Many of you will have different ways of meeting with God. But you still got to be still. You got to be still. Some of you will have a place, a little corner, maybe a place to drive up to, or, that you just know wow, 
God's there. Well, God's everywhere. <laughs> okay? But that for you is, is what I like to call a trigger. Right? What happens when you pull a trigger? Something happens. Something ha what happens? Something big, right? Yeah. All right? An explosion of things happens. So when you pull that trigger in worship to God, when you pull that trigger, man, something happens. You are transported. You are no longer dealing with this world because God is taking you in spirit to hang out with Him. Your trigger may be different than mine. Mine is worship. <clears throat> Music worship. Once in a while, now I can get there just in prayer. I can, I can get there just by stopping, breathing. <coughs> Breathe him in. You've got to find what your trigger is. Because as you use it, and as you continue to use the trigger, you'll get bolder. You'll get stronger. You'll desire that place more than anything. When Moses saw the bush that was on fire but didn't burn, did he say, oh, hmm, that looks kind of cool. Hey, guys, check this out. Oh, there's nobody here but the sheep, right? No, he set his heart. He set his mind to go find out what it was like. He moved into it. He went there and God met him. Got an illustration for you. Just... The idea of, of you having to set your mind and set your heart with the ultimate desire to hang out and be with God. You have to. You have to. This is very paraphrased, okay? So don't, don't think I'm quoting this. This is about a story. But I want you to think about it this way. Three guys come running up to their friend's house, banging on the door. John, John, John! Mother comes to the door. What is your guys' problem? Settle down. No, 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 no. Ma'am, I'm sorry. You don't understand. We have to take John and we got to go. So they go into John and John's laying there right on his bed, paralyzed. Come on, John, we're going to go. We're going to take you someplace. Can't, man. Dad took the cart and the donkey. Can't, can't go. I'm, I'm kind of stuck here. We're carrying you. We got you, man. We got you. We're going to take you someplace. Because we just heard about this guy. He was doing some teaching. And the words that he spoke just blew our minds. Man, our hearts just kind of rumbled around in us. And we didn't know what to think. And we saw the way he interacted with the people. And we saw him heal people. And demons were cast out. There is power in this guy. We know it. Well, well, who is he? Man, I don't, I, don't, does it matter? You're coming with us. We're taking you to him. His name is Jesus. He's from Nazareth. Some people say he's a prophet. Some people are actually saying he's the Messiah. Man, guys, it's, there's no way. It's, you can't carry me that far. We got you. You're coming with us regardless. You don't have a choice. <laughs> So they carry him, huffing and puffing. John, dude, you gotta lose some weight. <laughs> they take him, and when they get to the house where Jesus is, it's packed. Roadblock. Roadblock. Distraction. John says, see, look, man, we can't even get in there anyway. You guys couldn't get in there individually, let alone carrying me. Let's just go home. We're going in there. John, I told you whether you like it or not, you're going in there. They were resolved. Nothing was going to stop them. Didn't matter if there was a roadblock in their way. They didn't focus on the roadblock. Their focus was on the Christ who was inside. They saw through the roadblock. They saw through all the distractions of the people. And what did they do? They took him around back, right? And they looked up. All right, John, this, I mean, hope we don't drop you. Okay? We, hope, we hope you don't, we don't drop you. We're going to do the best we can, but you're going in there. They climb up, and they drag his butt up to the roof. And probably with bare hands, maybe they had a, a, a knife. I mean, I know they didn't have a sawzall. 
<laughs> right? They start digging through the roof. Making a hole right above where Jesus was. You know, little bits and pieces of the ceiling start falling in. Right? People start, what the heck is going on here? I'm sure Jesus sat back. Yeah, this is good. <laughs> this is good. They were resolved. They wanted nothing more than to get their friend in front of the one that they believed could do something about his, his condition. They dig the hole, and then they lower their friend down. Hopefully softly. Right? You never know. Did they have a rope? How far was the drop? John, don't worry about it. He'll fix you all the way. <laughs> they dropped. They got him down in front of Jesus. In front of the one. And it wasn't even his faith that did it. It wasn't his resolve. It was the resolve of his friends that took him and that carried him and brought him there. They were not to be denied. Church, that's how you have to act. You cannot be denied. That which is precious is right in front of you. That which is holy, that which is full of glory is right there for you to get. But... The enemy doesn't want you to have it. You're distracted. You're busy. You've got things going on. I don't care. I don't care. If you want it, you'll go get it. Regardless of the dragon that sits in front of it. Regardless of the crowd. Regardless of dinner needing to be cooked. Screaming kids. My mom, bless her heart. <laughs> she didn't even know Jesus. But when she wanted peace and quiet, she took care of us. Mm -hmm. Have a little spoonful of jelly. Mm -hmm. Laced with who knows what sleeping drugs. <laughs> 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 kids could bad. Huh? They tasted horrible. <laughs> but guess what? She got some peace and quiet. Kids are all... <laughs> crashed out, falling out of the floor. I'm just kidding, Mom, but it's not funny, right? <laughs> okay, we were a distraction to her peace. She took care of it. She slew the dragon. Three boys that were crazy and psychotic. Well, I wasn't. It was talking glad. <laughs> but the point is, if you want something, you're going to go get it. If you want something, you're going to go get it. You're not going to allow the enemy to take back that which is yours any longer or to keep you from it. It is so extremely important, I believe, in this day, in this day, for you to have the vertical relationship that you need to have. I mean, think about right now. What is the absolute most important relationship that you have? Don't say it. Think about it. And, and be honest, because it's not going to matter to me. Maybe your most important relationship right now is a child. Or a mom or a dad or a husband, a wife, a friend. Maybe you cannot honestly say that the most important relationship I have is with the Lord Jesus Christ. Because if it was, you would do everything you can to grow that relationship. To hang out with Him. <coughs> to be there. Because he knows all about you and he's willing to hang out with you. You would do everything that you possibly can. The vertical relationship is so important because where we're going, you think the ISIS thing in the Middle East doesn't affect you? Those are our brothers and sisters in Christ, church. One Christ, 11 Christians every minute. Or no, one Christian every 11 minutes dies for their faith. Guys, happened in Oklahoma, not necessarily for their faith, but a Muslim beheaded a young lady at work. Don't think that you're not going to be affected. We have been protected for a time. But if you read the book, if you read the end, then it gets ugly for the church. It gets ugly for us. We're persecuted. So if we're going to be persecuted, you better be armored up. You better be ready to go. You better know how to get in touch with God. You better know how to breathe in His peace in the midst of chaos. Because if you can't, you're going to flounder. 
Church, it's so important that you learn to get into God's presence. That if you hear him say one morning when the alarm clock goes off, he says, stay home from work. You don't question it. You just stay home. Call in. Tell him whatever you want. I'll be honest. <laughs> yeah, I got, I got a message from the Lord this morning. He said that I shouldn't go to work. <laughs> so I'm not. Who knows what he's protecting you from? Or who knows what he wants to do with you? You just have to be willing to be obedient. <laughs> God told me when he first called me to, to really move in, into to his presence. I was really struggling. He said, I want you to do what I tell you to do, say what I tell you to say, when I tell you to do it, when I tell you to say it, without asking questions. It's very difficult for me. I'm, I want to know the reason. I want to know why. I want to I know, you know, okay, what happens if. I, that's me. I confess. I am slow. I want, to, I want to be able to have it all planned out. You know, the word says that it's a, a light, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. I want the whole superhighway lit up, folks. I, I don't. Where's trust in that? But that's what I want. So when he said that, I'm like, okay, God, I can do that. I can, I can do that. Great. It was about a week later. I was driving a truck. I was doing some contract work for, for a guy. And I was driving a truck with, with his uncle. And we were delivering nuclear cameras. I don't even remember where we were going. We were in dead, gridlock traffic, not moving anywhere. I had some worship music on my iPod, and I was just kind of... And God said, I want you to get out of the truck and dance. <laughs> oh, you think I wasn't scared? Oh, no, 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 I don't dance. Period. I, I got no moves. Right? Amen. That's it. <laughs> It's a genetic trait. It's exactly right. I mean, I don't, and I, I got panicked. And I, and I stopped for a minute, and I'm thinking, right? I get in the way. I'm thinking. I'm going, that can't be God. What does he care if I dance? Do what I tell you to do when I tell you to do it. I didn't think it meant something that was going to make me feel like an idiot. Okay. I get out of the truck. I have one. Worship music on really loud, hoping to drown out my own thoughts, right? I'm like, okay. But I'm, actually, I think I had Petra on, so it was a little more crazy, all right, than worship. And it was loud, and I'm like, I'm trying to dance, <laughs> feeling really stupid. Some guy gets out of his car, and he comes back and says, what are you doing? I said, well, I was in the truck, and, I, and you know, I was kind of praying, and, and God said, get out of the truck and dance. It opened up a door for me to witness it. It may have been the only gospel he ever heard. I don't know. But God knew what he needed. And you know what, church? Look, I'll be honest. I'm willing to be a fool for him. Man, really. It's hard. It's not easy. I don't always relish it. I don't, I don't get up every morning and say, Jesus, how can I be embarrassed today? <laughs> no. But man, I don't want to embarrass him. <laughs> I don't want to embarrass him. I want at the end of the day for him to say, I'm pleased with you today. And if I'm not willing to be obedient, how is he going to be pleased? Now, he's pleased with us regardless because he loves us, right? But I'm talking about individually, as we move and as we grow, we have to have the relationship with him that we hear his voice, that we recognize it as his. That we are strengthened by it. That we move in it. And you've got to find whatever trigger it takes for you to get there. It's that important. When I lived in Canyon City, this, is a, this relates very well to this valley. Okay? When I lived in Canyon City, before I lived in Canyon City, Colorado. Canyon City has 14, or the area, the Fremont County in Colorado, has 14 prisons, state and federal. Maximum security. There's some ugly stuff there. And my in-laws used to live there before we, before we moved there. And, and you come in, you come down um, Highway 115 through the mountains around Colorado Springs, and you get down to where it's just flat and ugly on Highway 50 between Pueblo and, and Canyon City. And you turn west, and at least you can see the mountains then. Right? And Highway 50 does a lot of this, up and down. And there'll be a place probably about three or four miles outside of Canyon City you come up on the hill, and it'd be like, 
sludge. The spiritual, demonic presence, the oppression of that place just hit you. And it'd be like, oh gosh, what happened? And you could feel it. And it was horrible. And you pray about it, and you're just like, wow, I'm so glad I don't live here. Great. Shouldn't have said that. Right? It wasn't a while, it wasn't too long later that we had to move there. God used a lot of circumstances to get us there, but we moved there. Driving in, ugh, sludge. A year, maybe not even a year, 10 months later, we're driving back from Pueblo, we went to the store. We're driving over the hills, right? I turned to my wife, Donna, and I said, you know, I said, it's kind of sad. She goes, what? I don't feel the sludge anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I don't feel it. It's become normal. It's become acceptable. You guys are life in a dying world. Your world is right here. And it's oppressed. The demonic activity, it's not like it is in Uganda. It's very different. But don't think that it's nonetheless here. Don't be the frog that you toss them into a pot of water and turn the, turn the, the temperature on low. And the frog just acclimates as it goes. The water gets hotter, the frog just chills. Okay. It's normal. I've accepted it until he boils to death. Until he boils to death. You, you throw that same frog into boiling water, it ain't going to happen. Screaming, yelling, trying to get out. Turn it on low, a little bit at a time, just a little bit of pressure, a little bit of heat, and he'll die in that pot. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of people in this area that are dying in the pot. They're dying in the pot, <coughs> physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. They're dying in the pot. The story of Daniel, <coughs> he was a, uh, the, the king was gonna make him the, the ruler over, over all the administrators and the satraps and make him ruler. And the other administrators were jealous so they decided they were going to look for something to accuse him by. They couldn't find anything. So they said, the only way that we're going to be able to accuse him of anything is we're going to have to find something that has to do with his God. So they go to the king. Yo, great king. We need you to, we think it would be really good for you to write an edict. One that couldn't be taken away or destroyed. One that couldn't be uh, removed as for the Medes and the Persians, that no person should worship any god or other person except you, O king, for the next 30 days. King's ego got stroked. All right. These guys think I'm God. That sounds like a good idea. Sign the edict. Use the signet ring. It's law. What did the administrators do immediately? What did Daniel do immediately? He heard about the edict. And in the midst of horrific situation, what does he do? <laughs> he went to his... I, see, I love this. The Bible is very specific at times, and, and you have to be able to look at the specifics. Daniel went up to his room, to the window that faces the east Jerusalem, and he opened the curtains. Okay? Could he have just gone in and laid down on his bed with the curtain closed? He could have. But see, that's not how he had done it. That's not his trigger. His trigger was to get on his knees in the window facing Jerusalem, God's holy city, and pray. Regardless of the junk that he might face. And he did. He did. They bring him before the king. The king tries all day. Oh, man, how can I say to Daniel? He's a good guy, man. He's the best administrator I've ever had. At the end of the day, they pressure him. You made the law, it has to happen. So he takes Daniel and he throws him in the lion's den. In the lion's den. The king didn't have any, any fun that night. Didn't eat, didn't sleep much. In the morning, the king rushes to the lion's den. 
He says, Daniel, servant of the Most High God, has your God, the one you, you serve day and night, been able to rescue you from the lions? What's important about that phrase? Whom oh, you serve day and night, right? Daniel's actions were noticeable to a pagan king. Because he went to the place on a regular basis. And that's where he got strength. That's where he got it. Church, you have to get it. How many of you, and, and this, is, this is not a negative thing, but how many of you have ever called your pastor and not gotten an answer? Right? And if, if you guys have never called him with an issue and he didn't answer the phone right away, whew, something's wrong. And I'm really going to be mad at you. <laughs> right? I'm busy talking to them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Okay? We do that. But let me tell you something. <clears throat> You got to be able to call the one, right? Now, there's a reason to call your pastor. There is. But I had a pastor just the other day, just the other week, he was talking about how he has people come to him on a regular basis. You know, and they tell him this, and this, this is what we and, and basically what they want him to do is make the decision for them. I'm not going to make that decision for you. Uh -uh, not my, I'm not getting in the middle of this. Okay. They gotta know God. They gotta be able to hear from God. You have to be able to hear from God. What happens if He's not available? Do you, do you shake and quake and go, "Oh my gosh, now I don't know what to do"? No, man, get your trigger. Pull it. Pull it again and again and again and again and again. And empty the magazine if you have to. I'm a firm believer in high capacity magazines. <laughs> I'm a firm believer in carrying more than one. <laughs> right. Keep pulling the trigger. I was in a class once, a personal defense class, and we were doing a, a, a shoot, and I asked the instructor, how many rounds of ammo do I have? And she said, uh, depends on how happy your trigger finger is. I took that to mean bring a lot. So I had four 14-round magazines, one in, my, one in my weapon, three on my belt, and in one little quick jaunt where they grab you by your belt and your neck because they don't want you turning it around, right? You get to move and you get to walk. And as you're walking, they're calling out targets. Boom, 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 boom. Boom, 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 boom. And just go, I dropped 36 rounds in two minutes. That was the most fun I ever had shooting a gun in my life. But you know what? If we take that principle and we use that as our trigger, to get into the presence of God, and we do that with all of our might as unto the Lord, and we bang, 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 bang. Mighty and powerful things will happen in your life. The most important relationship that you can have is with Him. Amen. You gotta hear Him. You gotta be able to hear Him. And if you can't, if you struggle with it, join the club. We all do. But, but, God is a relational God. And he wants to hang out with you. <clears throat> I'm going to close up. And as we do, I want you to know I will be here as long as it takes. I'll stay all night. Did you bring your lunch? <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. To help you get to that place that you want to get to. But you have to desire it. I can't get you there. I can't take you there. I can't do anything to force you to get there. You have to desire it with all the resolve that you have. So the worship team is going to come up and they're going to play a praise song because God is worthy to be praised. Right? He's worthy to be praised. Then, you guys knew you were doing this, right? Surprise! Get up here. Then, your pastor is going to pray for you. He's going to open up the altar. You don't have to come to the altar. You can stay put, whatever you want. You're welcome to stay here as long as you want. Or you can leave. He'll dismiss you. Okay? If you'd like to stay, I'll pray with you. We're going to have some, some, just some instrumental worship music playing. We had music playing when you came in. It had words. Sometimes words can be a little distracting because we tend to try to sing it. We're going to have some just instrumental music playing. We're going to enter into a time of just soaking worship. If you can do that on your own, you don't need any assistance, and you want to do that to help just others, I'd 
the powerful presence of God being here, please do, but don't feel obligated. And you don't have to stay. I'll stay as long as it takes. I mean, when I leave, I have to go cook. So I'm willing to stay. I'm willing to stay because if you desire that vertical relationship with all of your heart, man, I want to do whatever God allows me to do to help you.